I want to um, share with you all something today that I think is um, more uh, kind of kind of activating. I'll I'll put it that way. This is a really good series that we've been in, and I think this is a conversation and a topic that needs to happen even more widespread across across Christendom, especially here in America, where our focus has been so much on the church. Um, and Jesus' message was on the kingdom of God. Yes. And there's, there's, there's two different approaches to that. There's two different invitations that we offer to the world if our focus is on church versus the kingdom of God. Now, I want to be clear that every person who is in the kingdom of God is the church. The church as a body of believers who have been united by our shared faith in Jesus Christ for our salvation. Our shared belief that his blood that was shed on the cross is what God uses to wash us clean and to make us holy and to forgive us and to bring us out of darkness into the light. Our shared faith, everyone around the world and in all times who has put their faith in Christ for that is our brother and sister um, in the family of God and, and part of the kingdom of God. So as, as citizens of the kingdom of God, members of God's family, we are the church. Um, but, but historically, there has been a, a separation of that message where the message that Jesus preached about the kingdom of God being here and the kingdom of God is here, it's present, it's in your midst. It's, if I cast out demons, uh, by the Spirit of God, that you know the kingdom of God has come upon you. Like this message that was the, the main tone of his, of, his, um, of his ministry and inviting people into that and into relationship with God as their father, that message has been lost due to an institutional mindset that has crept inside the church. So the church has lost the organic gospel disciple-making movement and momentum that it had in the book of Acts. And if you don't know, in the book of Acts, after Jesus had told his disciples, go wait in, in, uh, um, in Jerusalem and you're gonna receive power, and Pastor Aaron was sharing about that on Pentecost, uh, about Pentecost and how the Holy Spirit is gonna come and, and fill people, like 120 people were in that room. And then 3,000 people got saved the very first day of the church because of response to Peter's message. And then over some time, persecution began to happen in Jerusalem and believers spread out. They began to leave Jerusalem and go into all the different places. And when you look at the, the writings of historians, both Christian and non-Christian, they talk about the influence that Christians had on neighborhoods and cities and nations. Uh, and it wasn't about because there were strong, powerful, orators who were doing Billy Graham style crusades. It was because it was a movement. It was an organic movement. It was you and me out there in our lives. If we're farming, we're talking to other farmers. If we're in business, we're talking to other business people. If we're working at home, we're talking to other people in our neighborhood. Like it's, it was you and me out there sharing the gospel with our family and our friends and our neighbors and strangers. And that's how the movement happened. And that's how nations were impacted apart from the government structure. Uh, we've been trained to think that if we're going to turn America around, we've got we to change government first. That's not Jesus' strategy. It was, an, it was an organic movement, which means it wasn't institutional. It wasn't like some, somebody sat down and mapped out a whole plan for all of us and told us a script that we've got to read and say and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't organized like that. It was just all of us living life and impacting people. It didn't matter what the rules were and the laws were, so it doesn't matter if... if um, what the laws were about, about abortion, um, I'm responsible for somebody considering it in my circle. and sharing the hope and, and the possibilities with that person in my circle. It doesn't matter what, what the laws are when it comes to uh, sexual orientation and all those kind of things. I'm responsible for sharing the power of the gospel to those who are in my circle who are struggling with some of those issues. And so the more I'm doing that in my circle and you're doing that in your circle, they can pass whatever laws they want, but the nation will be changed in our neighborhoods, right? 
So that's how the kingdom was expanding. And, and whether it be then and now, that's how the kingdom of God was expanding, where more and more people were coming to know Jesus Christ in governments that were oppressive specifically to Christianity. How does Christianity thrive under governments that are oppressive to Christianity? I'm telling you right now, it doesn't come from pulpits because it's easy to target the people speaking on the platform on the pulpit. It's not easy to track every one of you who's sharing the gospel. That's how it happens. However, as the church began to, began to grow, and specifically with the influence of, uh, of Constantine in Rome, many of us talk about how Constantine, uh, he, he made Christian the, the official religion of Rome, and like, oh yeah, that's, that's awesome. No, it's not awesome. You can't mandate Christianity. You can't force people to believe in the hearts and confess with their mouths that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. They have to believe it in the heart. You can't mandate that. So he thought he could do that. And in him doing that, he also, that's what, uh, the beginning of the institutionalization of the church. And so this, this momentum of you and me owning the mission of Jesus, owning our responsibility that every Christian is a missionary, the momentum that began to spread all across, it began to be boxed into buildings because Constantine said, just like all the other institutions, uh, politics and government and entertainment, he wanted control over it, so he told the church to box it in so that there could be control. So he worked with, quote unquote, bishops to set up an organizational structure so that the church can be more controlled. Know that it was him. It wasn't God. It wasn't the Bible. It wasn't Jesus. It was him. And so in that structure, now you have a hierarchy that's not biblical. And if you have a hierarchy that's not biblical, now you have to create principles and rules and policies to enforce it that are also not biblical. Right. Namely, that the people who are in the hierarchy are the ones responsible for the ministry. They're the ones who are knowledgeable and educated and ordained by God. Those who come on the platform and wear nice robes and big hats. And the people who are sitting at the everyday person, now they were taught that they were not qualified. They were taught that they didn't know enough. They were taught, and so this momentum of ministry and organic disciple-making movement, it got pushed into a box, and the people were taught to be disempowered. That's how we have now, in especially Western Christianity, this kind of setting where everyone comes to listen to the expert. But the movement that's happening now is that the experts are saying, hey, y'all, uh, we're getting tired of being the experts. <laughs> no, we're getting if, if you think about how much ministry I will be able to do compared to how much ministry all of you are able to do, it makes no sense for all of you all to depend on me. <laughs> Just from a practical, right? That's not a movement. That's not practical. Especially if me being on stage, or when I say me, I mean any pastor being on stage only happens once a week. And you're talking to friends, family, neighbors, every single, and so what happens if you think I'm supposed to do it all, Monday through Saturday, you are foregoing all kinds of opportunities that God wants you to intervene in the lives of other people. All kinds of opportunities that God wants to move through you to impact people Monday through Saturday, and then we all come together and we just, and we, and for, for a special event, and we can enjoy being together, God can move while we're here, but this is only one and a half hours out of the 168 in the week. Movements don't happen that way. What I want you to know is that that whole structure was not God's plan. So now, across the board, we're trying to say, hey, you all, uh, uh, you have a spirit just like I have a spirit. You're gifted just like I'm, I'm gifted. But what we're fighting against is, uh, is something that's been happening for over a thousand years. We're trying to now retrain the people of God where you understand you are supposed to be doing ministry, not just me. But we have these things like, like, like ordinations and clergy, like the clergy is up here and the, and the laity. Is the, and there's, oh, there's, this, there's this big gap. There's this big gap where the clergy do the ministry and the laity just watch and support and all those kind of things. I was talking to a pastor this is past Friday. Uh, he's out of Sacramento. He connected with me some online some kind of way. We, so we just 
as you know, my thing is if you want to chat, you know, hit my little link and we can we can chat. And so I'm talking to him on on online, and I'm like, uh, he's like, I just don't have, I'm just not clear what what God's vision is for for this church. I'm like, well, how long have you been here? Well, I've been here for for four years. So I said, okay. He goes, my my dad was a pastor before that, and, like, and I grew up in this church. You grew up in this church, and you have no idea what God wants to do through the church? I said, uh-huh, okay, all right. And I'm struggling with, you know, people, don't, they don't want to serve, and they don't want to volunteer, and all this kind of stuff. And I tell them, I say, I'll come up with an idea, and I say, hey, we need someone to sign up for this. We need, we need someone to sign up for this. I'm like, huh, that's amazing. You mean people don't want to sign up for your ideas? You having a hard time getting them excited about what you came up with? Man, that's, that's confusing. I don't know why that's not working. I'll tell you why it's not working. That's not the plan. Perhaps you should ask them what God put in, inside of them. I guarantee you they'll be excited about what God pulled, told them to do instead of trying to convince them to be excited about what you think God told you to tell them to do. You, you, I said, you have this paradigm that is, that is all on you. And guess what? If you, have, if you grew up in this church and you have this paradigm that is all on you, I guarantee your people think it's all on you. So if all of you think it's all on you, then you're in trouble. You see, it's, it's ingrained. It's ingrained. Hundreds of years, you are trained to believe you are not empowered. You are trained to have this cognitive dissonance that in the word it says we have the Holy Spirit. That in the word it says the Spirit is supposed to be leading us and guiding us. That in the word it says those who have the Spirit of God are the children of God. Yet this cognitive dissonance that we can hear this, we can sing this, and live something different. And still believe only the pastor. And still believe only those who are ordained. And still believe only what happens on stage is significant. It's hundreds of years. For centuries, this has been our issue. And if we're going to see revival in America, that cannot continue. We've got to see it to where you and me know that we have the same. I don't have an ordained Holy Spirit and you have a, 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 a volunteer Holy Spirit. I don't, but, you, but you've been taught. So the reason why I want, I want to say this is because I want you to understand, like, for some of you who feel like you don't know God's call on your life or God's plan or the God's this and God's that, it, it's been ingrained. It's been ingrained. I mean, think about this. Think about how many Christians are, I don't know God's plan for my life. You know, God, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Saddleback guy. Rick Warren wrote the book, Purpose Driven Life. Purpose Driven Life. 60 million people bought that book. 60 million believers didn't know their purpose. I need a drink. <laughs> Why is that? Now I'm sure that there's people bought it, it was helpful, there's some clarity there, but, but why is that? Why is that? Because there's a, there's a lack of of understanding just what this book is saying. I remember being at a conference and there was some Chinese, uh, Chinese missionaries who were at this conference and I was able to, and I was curious about this, so I was able to kind of corner a couple of them during a break. I wanted to know, because I'm, you know, underground church are trying to just blow it up, blowing it up. I'm like, I'm like how, what, are y'all, what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? How, how is it that y'all over here you don't have the conferences we have. You don't have the access to Bibles that we have. You don't have the leaders that we have. You don't have the speakers that we have. You don't have the oratory. You don't have the buildings that we have. You don't have the, the podcast that we have. You don't have the books that we have. You don't. How are y'all going and we're not? That's what he said. Well, we, uh, we teach people that what we do. We read the Bible and we just do what the Bible says to do. <laughs> if it says cast out demons, we cast out demons. Amen. If it says lay hands on the sick and you'll see them healed, we lay hands on the sick. I went, that's all we're doing. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Man, that's a noble idea. What he's saying is we don't have the structure that disempowers people that you all do. We don't have the bureaucracy. 
So we have the same freedom and the empowerment. Like it, 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 we just, we read it, it's right there. <laughs> we read it and do it. Yeah. It's just that simple. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I do have a scripture that I would like to read, just for those of you who are nervous. Um, so, in, in Matthew chapter 13, and I, the last time I was sharing in this series, I, I mentioned this, but I will unpack a little bit more. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is unpacking all these different ideas about the kingdom of God. He's teaching all these different, and he's got some really long parables some, and some short parables, and a couple of these are just some imageries that, uh, images that he, that he shares. Uh, verse 30, 31. Here is another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree and birds come and make nests in its branches. It starts off small. It seems like it's not significant, seems like it's not valuable, but over time it becomes dominant. It might start off as the thing that you easily overlook, but over time you can't ignore it. And he says the kingdom of heaven is like that. And then he goes on with another one in verse 33. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast or leaven a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. The yeast that is in bread, like it's not even visible. Once it's in there, you can't tell that it's in there, but you can tell the effect of it being in there because the bread gets large. So there's leavened bread, that has or the yeast in there that, that, that gets big when it's in the oven. And then there's unleavened bread that's, that's flat, you know, like, like maybe like pita bread or something like that, right? It's unleavened. And so, so he's saying it's, it's just a little bit. And, and three measures is like enough to, to feed 100 people bread. And he says, if you just put a little bit in there, it, it, over time it impacts all of the bread. It influences all of the bread. Now, how does that happen? When he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about how it advances in the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls who are placed in certain areas of society and they impact it. And even though there might not be microphones and there might not be stages and there might not be lights and everyone else might not know what's going on, the, 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 the bread is rising. And even though no one might call their name the bread, where they live, where they work, where they learn, where they play, the bread is rising. He says, that's how the kingdom moves. And see, that can happen if the yeast is depending on only the ordained yeast. Think about this. Think about how many opportunities uh, are, 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 are lost because the average believer does not believe they can do something about the moment God has put them in. There, there are, and, and there, there are times even in your own, own life, you, you saw somebody uh, hurting or, or questioning or whatever, and you're in that moment. And some of you felt like, man, if, if only Pastor Sean was here. <laughs> and if only, if only Pastor Aaron was here. No, you were there. Yes. That, that's, that's your God moment. Stop trying to outsource your God moment to other people. Right? That's your friend, your neighbor, your coworker, and God didn't say, you know what? My bad. I put you here instead of Sean. I, man, what was I thinking? Well, I know what I was thinking. I'm thinking I am in you, and if you believe me and trust me, I'll speak through your mouth, I'll move through your hands. Those are your God moments. So we talk about when we pray, you know, Jesus said, pray that thy kingdom come. That kingdom, how? How? Just randomly out there, we can watch it and record it on our phones and post it? No, that kingdom doesn't come that way. The kingdom comes when you are talking to that person in front of you. 
The kingdom comes when you're sitting on the airplane. The kingdom comes when you're standing in line. The kingdom comes when you're in, the, in your break room. The, the kingdom comes then. When you learn these, these impulses. I remember sitting on a plane and usually because I do a lot of talking, you know, anytime, uh, uh, whether I have a mark or not, sometimes, believe it or not, sometimes I don't want to say nothing. Like sometimes I just want to relax, I just want to chill. So I remember being on this flight and sitting next to this person, I'm, I have a, a window seat, right? I've got a window seat because I'm trying to lean a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to lean, which means I don't want to talk to anybody right now. Right, so I, I'm I'm walking on there, looking like I I mean I'm trying to give all kind of indications. Do not talk to me. So <laughs> I have a hat on. I've got a book open. I want to look busy and sleepy, and I'm leaning right. And so so the person next to me says, "So how are you doing?" I'm like, ah. <laughs> uh, you, you know, pay attention to the clues, man. <laughs> pay attention to the clues. And so I'm like, I'm good. Clues, <laughs> clues. And as I'm sitting there saying, I'm good, God goes, here we go. I'm like, no, I'm, I don't, I don't want to be anointed right now. I don't. Anybody ever know what I'm talking about? Like sometimes you just don't want to be used, right? You just want to sleep, you just want to rest. I don't want to be used all the time. <laughs> And we sing these songs like, I surrender all. all. Right, use me for your glory when I'm ready. <laughs> so long story short, I ended up talking to this person and they were going through some serious stuff. I was able to encourage them and then the person said, man, it's no coincidence that I sat next to you on this plane. Absolutely it's not. It's not, right there on the plane. Right, and there, so there, there are moments like that where you'll, you'll feel this, this Holy Spirit impulse, this nudge. And one of the reasons, one of the ways you can know that it's the Holy Spirit is because you're too scared to do it anyway. Like, you know it's not you. You know it's not your idea. Your flesh doesn't want to do it. You think, well, maybe what if I mess it up? What if I can't quote enough scriptures? What if I quote a scripture and don't remember exactly where it's at? What if they ask me about the dinosaurs and I don't know what the dinosaurs got? I don't know. <laughs> What if, they, what if they ask me all this, what if they ask me questions that I, that I don't know? Then say you don't know. No one's asking you to talk about what you don't know. Talk about what you do know. Has Jesus changed your life at all? Even just a little bit? How about you talk about that? No one's asking you to be accountable for what you don't know. But God will create these opportunities for you to share what you, what you do know. And I just want to encourage you to lean into that. Are you going to mess up sometimes? Let me tell you what. No, you won't. It might not go the way you want, but that doesn't mean you messed up. Our job is sowing seeds. We reach in our bag of gospel seeds and we throw them out. That's it. You can't mess that up. It just... <laughs> you can't mess it up. You're not responsible for the condition of the soil. You're not responsible for the receptivity in their hearts. You're responsible for taking advantage of the moment that God puts you in to say something. I just want to encourage you sometimes instead of saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to pray for you, pray for them right there. Pray for them right there. Well, what, if, what, if, what if I mess it up? Okay, that's the devil talking to you. Hasn't he talked you out of enough opportunities? Hasn't the devil talked you out of enough opportunities? Don't you think he knows about your insecurities and your weaknesses? Don't you think he knows about the potential if you step out in faith even a little bit? God might show up. The devil believes that more than we do. So he uses those fears of rejection, those insecurities to just poke that little button just to get you enough to get in the car and not say nothing. And then you're feeling guilty 20 minutes to the house, right? God, I blew it. Oh. 
please give me another chance. And he's like, okay. <laughs> Guys, I remember, I remember being in the airport and I saw this guy with this, this twisted leg. He was right, right as he walked in, like where security is, right? And I felt like God wanted me to go pray for him. I was like, ooh. You know, a lot happens to me at the airport. I have a lot of resistance at airports for some reason. I'm just noticing a pattern. He goes, I go, I go, okay, uh, I was in Atlanta, right? Like, okay, God, I'll tell you what. Anybody want confirmation from God that he wants you to do something? God, if he is at my gate, when I get to my gate, then I will pray for him. Now, if you've ever been in Atlanta, it ain't like Sacramento. At Atlanta, it's a city. The likelihood of him being at gate A98 is mustard seed small. So I've responded to God with a challenge that I am comfortable with. God, if this really is you, because I'm a, I'm a man of faith, you know. If this is really, if you, if you, because you know, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I'm going to do it. Whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. Uh, but if this is really you, then have him at this gate. So I'm getting through security. I'm, I got to get on concourse this and concourse that to get all the way over to the gate. And I get to the gate and I'm sitting there. I'm like, man, I don't see nobody. Okay, God, it's okay. I understand your will is your will. I'm not here to argue with you. I'm thy, thy will be done. Thy will be done. As I'm sitting there, coming out of the bathroom is the guy pushing a, 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 a trash can. He just got through cleaning the bathroom. First of all, I'm like, how'd you get here before me? Uh, <laughs> secondly, here I am. Here I am. I go, oh, snap. Well, this has to be God, because there's just no way. There just is no way. I'm like, well, would you look at that? We're boarding right now. Uh, <laughs> Oh man, that's that's too bad, because I, because I know if if I'm getting if I'm in ministry and stuff, he might have some issues and concerns. I might, you know, I hate to miss my flight and I'm right here. Like it, it, it could take too long. It could take too long, man. That's that's too that's too bad. Beep. On the plane. Attention, everyone. This is your captain speaking. We've got a little delay. That's going to be about 45 minutes. <laughs> A little mechanical work delay, which should be up, up in the ground shortly. Thank you so much for your patience. I'm like looking out the window to see if I see the dude. For 45 minutes, I sat there, and I can't even describe to you the amount of regret I felt in that moment for chickening out. But guess what? I'm still in the game. God, just, just give me another chance. Give me another chance. A couple weeks later, I was in the bookstore, a Christian bookstore, and there was a guy in a wheelchair in a Christian bookstore. I turned around, and I was like, oh, wait, I wasn't ready. I just came to get a book. I wasn't, I wasn't ready. Oh, come on, man, I wasn't ready. I was just trying to be a, buy a CD for the youth group, and now we got... Uh, he, he's rolling by me. I'm like, I, so you want me to pray for him? Uh, okay, if you really want me to pray for him. <laughs> See, I, I figured I'd tell y'all some of the stories where stuff just didn't work out. Doesn't matter if I'm ordained or not. The struggle is real for all of us. So I delayed and delayed and delayed, and the guy was, him and his, his, his uh, uh, oh, here's what's crazy. So I was like, okay, if you tell me what's wrong with him, then I'll know. So he had an injury in his lower back. I'm like, oh, that can't be right. Oh, man. man that, whew, that came, that came kind of quick. I was hoping, I, I was hoping, hoping you'd tell me later. So I'm like, hey, how you, how you got, how, uh, <clears throat> how you, uh, what's up? How y'all, how y'all doing? Y'all doing all right? Y'all doing all right? What y'all, what, what you got there? Oh yeah, yeah, casting crowns. Yeah, they're good, casting crowns. Um, so, how often do you guys come to this bookstore? <laughs> <laughs> so 
So a little small talk and everything. And I said, so what, what happened? What happened to your, why, what is it that caused you to be in a wheelchair? I had this injury in my, in my lower back. And I, <laughs> okay. All right. Well, man, that's, that's tough. Well, hang in there. Hang in there. Uh, so they check out. They're leaving. They're going out into the parking lot. And I'm, I, as he's walking, him and his wife walking. Oh, well, he, she's walking. He's rolling. Uh, and I'm looking at them in the parking lot, and I'm thinking, I asked God on the plane for another chance, and here it, here it goes. Uh, it's too bad, because I might need another one after this. <laughs> so then I go out, I'm like, well, the thing is, I don't want to feel the regret again. So I go out there in the parking lot, hey, hey, <laughs> whoo, yeah, it's me again. Uh, so just wanted to know if y'all be okay if I pray for you. Oh, yeah, sure, no problem. Sure, sure. So I talked to them a little bit, prayed for him a little bit, and they, they went on about their way. And that was the whole the situation was over. I came back in like, see, God, I told you, if you tell me to do something, I'm going to. I'm, I'm. <laughs> Where you expect me to say, I, I grabbed her by the hand like Peter did. He stood up and he took off running across the park a lot. No, that's not what happened. What happened was I struggled to obey, but I did the second time. And that was it. There was nothing I think was like some amazing end to the story. The ultimate thing is God sparked something in my heart to do and I did it. I struggled a little bit, a lot of bit. I did it. There are other times where I feel like God wants me to do something, and I'm like, oh, man, absolutely, I see it. Boom, right? But I want to tell you those stories, because you might think it's because I'm a pastor. I want to tell you where I failed and where I blew it, so you can see that that happens to pastors. I was a pastor then too. I had seen people healed then too. People were delivered. I wasn't new. I was experienced and still had my moments. The kingdom of God, it comes in the places where God puts us as each of us just follow the impulses, those God ideas that he gives us, those things that he wants us to reach out. He doesn't tell us the whole plan, how it's all going to be played out. He just gives us little hints. Just do this. Just say this. Just pray. Just get their attention. And it's like the, further, the, instruct, uh, uh, the other instructions come after the very first step. We want all ten steps so we can see it, evaluate, and decide if we want to do it. That's not how it works. It'll come with an unction. Just a little something to do or say. It's just an unction. That's it. That's it. Don't look for the big old stuff. It's, that's it. There was a, a man named uh, Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Angel came to him and said, Cornelius, your, your giving and your prayers have come up as an offering to God. He was doing it when no one saw him. No one, he wasn't doing it for accolades. He wasn't doing it for affirmation. He was doing it because it was in his heart to do. And the angel said, God sees that as an offering to him. Guys, I just want you to know that the majority of the things that God's going to do do not happen on a stage. It happens when you think no one is looking, but the most important person to see it is looking. Learn to be content, and not just content, but fulfilled in doing good for the sake of benefiting that person. Don't let your insecurity feel like you have to have all this affirmation from people. This is what I call this, the stage syndrome. I, I made up this definition. If we could put that definition, I want because I want y'all to understand this definition. Only things said or done on a stage for others to see and affirm is significant, respect, honor, and counts in the eyes of God and the church, and therefore is valuable to me. All the work of God, it can't happen here. It can't happen here. These doors open and close. These doors have hours to them. There are no hours to your life and where God puts you. 
So don't think that if you're doing something because there's no stage and no one claps and no one whatever, that it's, that it's too small. There, aren't those, there are no small acts of service in the kingdom of God. Don't think it's not significant because it is. The kingdom of God redefines what we believe is significant. And these the moments that you do and that I do, they're significant in the kingdom of God. There are no small acts of service, no small offerings. That's not the way it is. Where we get that idea from that it's small? It's not small. The world may call it small, but not in the kingdom. It's not. Everything that you do is significant. If you person you connect with, if person you pray with publicly, uh, privately, all those kind of things. Just follow the, act, the impulse that he gives. And you can shine where he wants you to shine. Bloom for the kingdom of God wherever you're planted. And don't discount it because everyone wasn't watching. Just know that what you're doing adds up to what I'm doing. And what I'm doing adds up to what you're doing. And I, we collectively are the yeast that caused the whole loaf of bread to rise. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you. Pastor Sean.